Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to Knowledge 16, everybody. ServiceNow's big customer conference, about 12,000 people registered uh, here this year. Mike Nappy is here. He's the Senior Director of Product Management at ServiceNow. Mike, welcome back to theCUBE. Good to see you again. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. So we were talking, I got the pleasure of seeing a little preview at the financial analysts meeting on um, Monday. People are very excited about ITOM. You guys have made some acquisitions in that space, but give us the update. Yeah, so, you know, ITOM's actually been around, some of the technology's been around since the early days of ServiceNow. Um, really, I'd say our current strategy towards the market uh, really started with the acquisition of Nebula back in 2014. And uh, that acquisition was really strategic for us because what it allowed us to do is take this pretty mature ITOM market and really disrupt it. And the way we're disrupting it is we're viewing everything through kind of a services lens. And Service Watch allows us to do that. Instead of managing at the compute storage and networking layer, which is kind of the traditional ITOM uh, market for the last couple decades, what we're doing is we're taking our, our service DNA, if you will, and we're applying it to the world of infrastructure and operations management and managing uh, services directly as kind of the primary object. So Ser ServiceWatch brought you automated mapping and my understanding is that that's dynamic to change. Is that right? Can you explain that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, the idea of having a service maps in your CMDB is not a new concept. It's right. been around for as long as CMDBs have been around. But the traditional methods of building those services are incredibly manual and the resulting service definition is brittle. If the infrastructure changes, it's some poor soul's job to go in and do the care and feeding of that service and make sure it stays up to date. So the bottom line is it's just not really scalable, and so people gave up on service mapping pretty early on, uh, and just, uh, it's just not really practical. Service Watch really changes that because not only does it automate the mapping process itself and make it easier, but once it's mapped it and it's stored it in the CMDB, Service Watch itself takes care of updating itself when the infrastructure changes. So now you've got a service map that's actually reliable and you start building automation around it. So break down the ServiceNow ITOM you know, portfolio. What's in the suite? Yeah, so, so currently we've got a set of technologies for taking data out of our customer's hybrid infrastructure. So we've got our traditional discovery product, which is the primary way that our customers populate their CMDB. So that runs out across the network and essentially finds everything that's connected to the network and uh, records it in the CMDB. We then have service watch mapping, which allows you to describe the relationship between all those artifacts and a business service, okay? Um, in addition to that, we've got orchestration. Orchestration is our primary automation tool. It's essentially an extension of the ServiceNow workflow engine that allows you to drive work into external systems from ServiceNow. Um, and then on top of that, we've built uh, an event management product and a cloud management product. Right, okay, so let's I want to go back to the link between infrastructure and apps and ultimately the business process. So how are organizations taking advantage of that? Because in the old days, at least, people have a business process, they'd have an application portfolio, and they have a bunch of infrastructure, and they really didn't understand the relationship between the three. There was no link between the value of of, of an app, the infrastructure is running on, and how it served a business process. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, and it sounds like you're changing that. Describe Absolutely. how yeah. customers are taking advantage of it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it turns out there's actually more use cases for having this service mapping than we even envisioned at the time. Uh, the original and kind of primary use case is when you have an understanding of the service and what it's comprised of from an infrastructure standpoint, if something goes wrong in the data center, you lose a server or a database gets locked up, you can immediately understand what the impact is to the business because you understand what services that database is actually supporting. This is huge in terms of triaging your response, figuring out how, you know, what do we need to tackle first. And the other aspect of it is just because you have that understanding of all the dependencies, um, an operations engineer is able to understand root cause of an issue much more rapidly so that they can fix the issue and get the service up and running. So the kind of primary use case for the service mapping is around service availability and keeping services operational. But we've had customers that are using it for 
uh, data center migration planning. They want to just inventory all the services in their data center before they move. Um, they're using it for audit, uh, for BCDR uh, activities, uh, compliance activities, uh, you name it. Uh, the bottom line is that having a good understanding of how your business services are supported by your infrastructure is absolutely huge. And I think, just to add one other, you, you talked earlier with Sean Convery in the mm -hmm. security business unit. Security is another prime example of where understanding what the service impact is of a security event is just is huge. Well, I was, was going to say, Lauren uh, Dudson from EY talked about, you know, people have no idea kind of what the total cost of an application is when they're making a decision whether to end of life and swap it out or whatever, because they don't usually calculate all the back-end processes behind just the server license and the maintenance fee that's actually supporting that, and then they can make an informed decision based on the business value, what it's supporting, whether it's worthwhile to keep that in play. He said that the, their eyes are like, whoa, we had you know, yep. no idea. It was just a bucket of money in the infrastructure before. Yep, yep, yeah, it's another great use case. I mean, just understanding the cogs behind a service. Uh, another thing that's happening is our customers are starting to look at a cloud strategy and moving some subset, or in some cases all, of their existing services into the public cloud. So first understanding how those services are currently comprised really informs how they want to do that migration strategy, how they want to put that together, and, and what services they want to move first in the cloud versus others. So, um, well, two points. One is you're right on on the value piece. That's very clear. People used to struggle with sort of the value of IT. You're sort of demystifying that uh, clearly. Um, I want to understand more about the orchestration, the automation, and the cloud management. Can, mm -hmm. can we unpack that a little bit? Kind of what's the difference between sort of orchestration and, and cloud management, and what exactly does ServiceNow do there? Sure, absolutely. So orchestration, first, of all, uh, first off, is kind of a general purpose automation tool. So it's like a Swiss Army knife. You can pretty much use orchestration to automate any kind of process. On top of orchestration, we built cloud management. And it started off being fairly simple uh, automated provisioning of VMs in uh, Amazon or in VMware. And the idea there would be that you would, uh, you'd be able to templatize certain types of VMs, put them on the ServiceNow service catalog, and a developer could walk up to that catalog, order the VM they wanted, and it would automatically get provisioned in the cloud. Huge use case. There's a lot of companies out there are still doing this manually, and it takes weeks to provision it. We would do that in minutes. Um, we've evolved way past that now. Um, we now support uh, not only Amazon, but as you heard uh, earlier, this week, uh, we have a partnership with Amazon around Azure and uh, other cloud providers. Microsoft and around Azure. <laughs> yes, yes. You, you, said, you said Amazon around Azure. Oh yeah, was, good point, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Microsoft. I want to make that My decision. ears went, whoa, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> did I miss some news? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Microsoft yeah, okay. around Azure. You? So in any event, we can, uh, we can provision not only VMs in those environments, we can provision entire services in those environments. But the flip side of it as well is very important. We integrate with those environments to be able to generate a dashboard that shows you cost and utilization across your company of your cloud providers. And that's really huge for under making informed decisions around how am I going to use my different cloud providers. It's kind of like supply chain management. It's huge because you can get the, those metrics from any one individual cloud supplier, but as you do right. inter-clouding, we like to call it sometimes, you don't have an apples to apples comparison, you're providing that obviously. Yep. And then the ITAP acquisition gave you what, entrance into OpenStack, Zen, yep. and then you're, people are sometimes confused, are, are, is ServiceNow doing what Chef and Puppet do? You, you can, but you don't have to, right? That's right, no, in fact, we have a good partnership with Chef and Puppet mm -hmm. and uh, other configuration automation tools like that. And our orchestration can certainly connect to those environments where our customers have them and connect them to ServiceNow processes. So, and Ansible too, we don't, sorry Red Hat, we didn't mean to leave you out of the uh, yeah. discussion. You don't yeah. care. Yeah, no, we're, <laughs> we're pretty agnostic on yeah. that. Orchestration, where you put the slider bar, we can go right to the last mile to the metal or we can go to another orchestration product to drive that. So um, the planes are backing up here in the cube. A lot of people want to get on mic, but I'll give you the last word. Just sort of knowledge 16, ITOM. Give us the bumper sticker from your perspective. Yeah, well, ITOM's really huge for service now. We've seen uh, amazing traction over the past year. We've essentially doubled our attach rate with our existing install base. And um, the, uh, this kind of message around service-centric operations management is really resonating with our customers. 
The holy grail that everybody wants is that service health dashboard. It shows you all your mission critical services and the real time health of those services. And that's really what we're after. And it's really uh, disrupting, I think, traditional ITOM as we know it today. All right, Mike Nappy, thanks very much for coming back to theCUBE. Appreciate your time. Absolutely, thanks guys. All right, keep it right there. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Knowledge16. We'll be right back. <laughs>